Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. Hey guys, it's Avril. Before we begin, we want to give a shout out to one of our thoughtful reviewers on iTunes Mm -hmm. on November 2nd, 500 Years Dungeon, wrote, like historiography, da 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 da, five stars. (laughs) The historians that make up Dig History are not only entertaining, but are expanding history in a way that is accessible to everyone, not just the suits in universities. Loving it. Thanks, 500 Years Dungeon. Thank you. If you leave us a review on iTunes, we will be sure to share it on uh, our next episode. So um, leave us a, ra- a rating and review if you have a chance. We appreciate it. If it's good. If it's bad, we're going to share it on social media and make fun of you. Yes, that's true. Yeah, um, j- I think it was actually like historiography, but fun. Oh. It just got cut off. It just got cut off. Like, histori- like historiography, but fun. Right. Thanks, 500 Years Dungeon. Because historiography is not fun. You're the cat's pajamas. Historiography is fun. It's not fun. It's amazing. Okay, okay. Okay. <clears throat> Hold on. If you grew up on the Great Lakes like I did, or even if you grew up far away from the Great Lakes, but you happen to be a big Gordon Lightfoot fan, which I know many of you are, then you know November on the lakes can be brutal. As the weather turns cold, the winds coming from the west, or... You know, if you live in Cleveland, coming from the east, um, whipping across the lake can or elsewhere pick up ferocious storms that translate into significant late autumn lake effect snowfalls. It's one thing when you're on shore here in Buffalo or elsewhere on the lakes living through a tough storm. As Buffalonians say, just buy a six pack and stay in and watch the game. <laughs> Assuming the game is happening and it's not under 12 feet of snow, which then volunteers have to go and shovel out. Yeah, watch somebody else's game. Watch somebody else's game. Like Florida or something. But during the heyday of Great Lakes shipping, when ships crossed these huge lakes loaded down with cargo, a fall storm could be, and often was, deadly. Uh, You might be familiar with one particular fall shipwreck, the 1975 sinking of the freighter, the Edmund Fitzgerald, sometimes known as Big Fitz. Um, It sunk during a brutal gale on Lake Superior. But today we're talking about another November storm, one that took place 62 years earlier. That storm became known as the Great White Hurricane of 1913. This storm was so severe that it killed 250 people and caused millions of dollars in lost ships, cargo, and property damage. This was a winter storm that exemplifies the storms of the Great Lakes region. Hurricane force winds coupled with blinding blizzard conditions, heavy snowfalls, and bitter cold. And actually, we have a November storm predicted for next week, so <gasps> this could be a reality here for Shh. us. I have to drive to school tomorrow, so please don't. No, no, no. It's supposed to be, like, after Thanksgiving. Phew! Good. I'll just hunker down with some turkey. I'm Sarah. And I'm Charles Dickens. Are you, though? <laughs> I look like him. <laughs> And I'm Avril. And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. The Great Lakes have always been a conduit of trade, well before Europeans ever walked on the North American continent. Native Americans navigated the lakes with birch bark canoes, which were lightweight enough to carry between bays and rivers. They didn't attempt to take those canoes across the lakes. They knew that was too dangerous, but instead they kept to the shorelines. When the French arrived in what is now Canada and the northeastern United States, they quickly became interested in exploring these massive lakes. Samuel de Champlain was the first person to describe the Great Lakes, but it was René Robert Cavalier sur de la Salle who first lost a trade vessel to a Great Lakes storm. And of course, Samuel de Champlain is what Lake Champlain, where I'm from, is named after. Correct. La Salle brought, built the first large vessel dedicated to Great Lakes trade, which he dubbed Le Griffon. <laughs> <laughs> we need Marissa here for all this oh, French. She ain't fun anymore. Historians aren't really sure whether this was the first ship built to travel the Great Lakes, but it was certainly the first large European-style ship to travel the lakes. 
There might have been some others before the griffin, but there's so little evidence that no one can agree. The one thing that is most interesting to us about the griffin is that it was built in Buffalo, at the mouth of what was then called Cayuga Creek, essentially in the area that is now downtown Buffalo. So if you're familiar with the area, it seems that this was actually right near what is now Canal Side. Yeah, and it's kind of confusing the sources on this because uh, Cayuga Creek is actually a tributary of the Buffalo River mm-hmm. now. Right. So it sound, they say in the sources it says it was built at the mouth of Cayuga Creek, right. but there isn't a mouth of Cayuga Creek. It's the Buffalo River. So um, that's sort of my interpretation of that, that it must have been down there at the mouth of the Buffalo River right at Canal Side. But isn't that because when they did the canal, they widened both the Buffalo River and Cayuga Creek Mm-mm, to Cayuga merge. Creek feeds into Buffalo, the Buffalo River. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is why we have so many things in Buffalo that are now called LaSalle. The Griffin was launched in 1679 and sailed across Lake Erie, up and around Detroit, through Lake St. Clair, along the St. Clair River between Michigan and Ontario, and only a couple of weeks after its launch, the crew became the first Europeans to navigate Lake Huron. They stayed on Mackinac Island at the very tip of the Michigan Mitten, if you can picture that. They're right at the very tip um, at the top for a couple of weeks. They stayed there for a couple of weeks. And then LaSalle sent his crew back toward Buffalo with the ship loaded down with fur while he stayed behind to explore the area by canoe. He's very interested in being credited as a great explorer. An early September storm whipped up and the Griffin sank somewhere en route. Just as a side note, several shipwreck hunters have claimed to have found the griffin, usually in Lake Huron or Lake Michigan, but they've all been proven wrong. It's never been found. Hmm. So we have here a long history of shipwrecks on the lakes, and many of them are due to fall storms. Of course, this likely also had to do with the design of the ship. As time went on and people learned more about how to navigate successfully on the lakes, ship design adapted to the weather and conditions of the region. Mm, Light bulb. However, Mm. while ships evolved, their design was centered around their ability to carry as much cargo as possible. This was really important because the lakes were a critically important shipping and trade route, especially between many of the cities we now know as the Rust Belt. Buffalo, Cleveland, Toledo, Detroit, Milwaukee, and Chicago. Right. And that's not all, obviously, not all Rust Belt cities. Pittsburgh is also a Rust Belt city, but that's what connects those particular ones. Pittsburgh is not on the lake. Correct. Erie is. Is Erie considered a Rust Belt? Yeah, a Mm -hmm. Rust Belt city. Raw materials mined or manufactured in the Midwest, as well as grain from the breadbasket and meat from Chicago, traveled by ship across the lakes, were then unloaded in Buffalo, where they were then transported to New York City and elsewhere. This is why um, this is, you know, the Erie Canal, of course, was a major part Mm -hmm. of this trade as well until um, it was kind of bypassed. Right. The lakes were the hub of business and trade between the early 19th and mid 20th century. Making sure that ships were big enough to carry plenty of goods was always the priority. And so ship design prioritized cargo over safety. Long, flat ships were prone to letting water in through the hatches when large waves would crest the deck. As historian Michael Shoemaker points out, quarters for sailors were usually very minimal. The large, heavy, slow ships did fine in calm summer weather, but sitting but were sitting ducks in turbulent winter weather. And communication devices, which were available in the 1910s, were rarely on board. Dumb. In addition to the design of the ships, people were also distrustful of weather prediction. The Weather Bureau, what we now call the National Weather Service, was officially created as part of the U.S. Army in 1870 and began issuing weather predictions in the late 19th century. But people continued to rely on their own folk ways of predicting the weather, especially mariners who felt like they understood the lakes better than any scientist ever could. Magic. Many... Many mariners didn't trust the Weather Bureau because it seemed as though their predictions often fell through. This wasn't because the Weather Bureau wasn't good at tracking the weather, but because Great Lakes weather can be incredibly unpredictable. 
No one knows us better than Buffalonians. For example, in 2006, we had the October Surprise, which mm-hmm. sounds like, you know, an unwanted baby. Which, I think there were some unwanted babies there were after some unwanted the October afterwards. Surprise. Which seemed to appear out of nowhere, leaving people without power for days at a time. And then, of course, we had Snowvember. Snowvember. And in fact, we are recording this on the third anniversary of Snowvember. Elizabeth, you need to come over here because you were affected by Snowvember. Oh my god. And Snowvember. Facebook is reminding me. Exactly. It's showing me all my memories of then. But it was horrible, you guys. I drive a mom van, like a minivan, and the snow was level with the roof of my mm-hmm. car. Like it was gone. I didn't yeah. know where my van was. Yeah. Like that's how deep the snow was. Like when guys. we say that people awful. were digging their cars out, we don't mean like they were digging the tires out. We mean like they were literally unearthing their cars yeah. Yeah. from like snow. mountains of yeah. snow. Like I couldn't open my back yard, my, my back door. It was mm-hmm. so snow. Yeah. It, it's awful. Absolutely crazy. And just very, very quickly to explain why Buffalo, and also it's not just Buffalo, but if the wind goes the other way, it goes to Cleveland. Right. Um, why we get those storms is because in November, the lake is still relatively warm. The right. water temperature is still relatively high. And so when a cold front comes through, it picks up so much heavy wet water. I was going to say. Wet it water. Bring, it, it, it picks up so much moisture out of the warm lakes mm-hmm. that then it it freezes in the atmosphere. atmosphere. Yeah. And then once it comes into land and hits kind of usually higher elevations yeah. it dumps yeah. snow it doesn't snow it's just like a wall of snow and literally right. I, I, all of us i'm sure can remember here in buffalo seeing the pictures and the, the uh, video of that front coming in you could see, it was a wall, it was of, a wall of snow so coming through it was so crazy we'll um, have to put some pictures of that on the on the uh, show notes. Yeah, so maybe even I, if we yeah. can find the YouTube videos of it. Cause it oh, yeah, that's a good idea. It was crazy. It was intense, yeah. And what was weird about it, too, is that, like, you and I, in living the North in Downs, Tonawanda in and, yeah. and Williamsville, you know, we got snow. Um, no, uh, it's November, I got a dusting Oh, we got... melted by the, the time the afternoon came around. Yeah, it, well, in Williamsville. Like we were dying. Right. Yeah. Literally, there were people dying in the storm. Yeah, people died. Um, in Williamsville, we did get a like maybe a foot and a half or something, but it did. It melted really, really quickly. Mm-hmm. And you, you know, things were canceled everywhere. You couldn't do, people in the North Towns are like, what is going on? Because yeah. we weren't seeing any of it. Right. Wh- well, while... except for you could drive down because buffalo is flat right like all mm-hmm. the midwest you could drive down one of the main highways and you could see the clouds exactly. and the snow wall in the distance because it's only you know two or three miles south of mm-hmm. where we are and there's that snow wall yep just looming it's crazy it was it really was crazy it was such a bizarre experience and so that we we say all of this just to kind of emphasize why first of all why november is always a critical month that's the month that the edmund fitzgerald went down on november Mm -hmm. 10th it's always right in there it's in this bizarre sort of moment where it's still fall so temperatures are still sort of warm but you can still get slammed with these storms yeah anyway 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 uh experienced sailor in source as well as those who lived in the port cities and worked with the shipping trade tended to believe their own experience and their gut instinct over the predictions of the weather service which Everyone still does. Right. Right. Anyone, I think people probably all over the world do this, but in snowy places, people always believe that they have way more experience with winter weather than, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, the, the news people can ever tell them. And it feeds into it when things like November happened because it wasn't particularly well um, predicted. Right. I mean, we knew we were going to get a storm. We mm-hmm. didn't realize we were going to get seven feet of snow. No. Anyway. So... In 1913, when the Weather Bureau began issuing warnings in early November about a low-pressure system that had formed in the northern Pacific and was moving east along the U.S.-Canada border, 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 <laughs> few mariners gave it really any thought. It seemed completely typical for that time of the year. It was creating snow and wind, but winter was coming mm-hmm. after all, so nothing unusual. Even when the chief weather observer in Cleveland called shipping companies to personally warn them about the coming storm, they shrugged it off. One other thing, sorry, okay. one other thing might help us understand why 
So many captains shrugged off weather warnings. The Great Lakes have a very short shipping season. For instance, Lake Erie, the shallowest of the lakes, freezes completely or almost completely almost every year, although less and less often lately because we've had some relatively warm winters, um, which is actually kind of bad because it means that we continue to get bad snow. Yeah, all year, all winter long. Right. Typically, upwards of 90% of the lakes freeze over every year. This means that between November and April every year, no shipping can take place, making those last few runs in early to mid-November even more crucial. And it's even more tempting even in impending bad weather. So on November 6th, 1913, the storm began to show its face. Winds from the north were getting stronger, producing bigger and bigger waves. Nonetheless... Most captains saw it as par for the course and set out anyway. After all, the shipping season isn't all that long on the lakes. Many of them freeze over, either partially or completely, so squeezing in as many trips as possible in the late fall was important. As the winds gained strength, the Weather Bureau officially issued a gale warning, but even that didn't influence most captains because there was no real indication of how dangerous the winds might be. Captains and crews had sailed through gale warnings before, and nothing indicated that this storm was going to be any different. Right. There wasn't, like, a clear um, indication of what really a gale warning meant, right? A gale warning could be anything from a fairly heavy wind to hurricane force winds. And they didn't say, this is going to be an extremely severe gale warning, right? Right. So what makes a Great Lakes storm so dangerous? After all, these are lakes, right? How bad could they possibly be? Well, if you're not familiar with the Great Lakes, I want you to go directly to your computer or to your phone and pull up a map of the lakes. These lakes are huge. Lake Superior is the second largest lake in the world, second only to the Caspian Sea. Huron and Michigan are fourth and fifth. Erie is the 11th and Ontario is the 13th. So the wind pushes so hard that the water can actually shift and pile to one end of the lake or the other. This sometimes between the wind and and different variations in pressure can create these things called seiches, Hmm. which are like the Great Lakes version of like a tsunami. Mm. It's not necessarily like a big wave, but it pushes all of the water to one end of the lake and it will just completely flood the shore Mm. on the other side. It's, It's really wild to behold. Even on the smaller, shallower lakes, Erie and Ontario, the shallowness actually creates smaller, choppy waves that don't allow a ship time to get a rhythm with the waves. On the other hand, the storms were generally short and survivable. These Great Lakes storms kind of blew in and blew out fairly quickly, and so most captains believed that braving the weather was still worth the risk. You'd think they would know better when disasters were not uncommon on the lakes. Just eight years earlier, a storm system that most mariners had dismissed as nothing serious very quickly developed into a severe late November gale. Winds were stronger than 70 miles an hour, and the snow was blinding. One of the most famous wrecks of the Great Lakes, famous for the day, not so much today, took place during this storm. A ship called The Matafa set out when the storm didn't seem like it was going to be very brewing, very severe. The ship was relatively new and state-of-the-art, so its captain saw no issue with setting out even with a storm brewing. But by the time the ship was out for a few hours, the captain realized they couldn't fight against the storm any longer and turned back to the safety of Duluth Harbor. But after trying a few times, the ship was badly damaged, then snapped in two just a few hundred feet offshore. The people of Duluth stood bundled up on the shore, helpless to do anything to rescue the men. They couldn't launch a boat to get them off the wreck, and there was no way they would survive taking a lifeboat to shore, so the crew was forced to spend the night on the deck of the ship to escape the flooding inside. The men trapped in the, on the aft of the ship all died of hypothermia. One even froze to the ship. The men on the prow had more shelter and huddled out of the wind and snow as best they could. Finally, morning, they were able to get a rescue boat to get 15 surviving men to shore. It didn't take long for captains to start regretting their decision in 1913, just as they had in 1905. The winds were quickly changing, first to the west, then northwest, then north, meaning that depending on your bearing, you might not see the storm until you were in it. 
On Lake Superior, the steamer, the E.H. Utley, struggled to keep safe and in working order when the blizzard suddenly hit. Visibility was so bad that the Utley almost collided with another ship that appeared out of the white-out snow seemingly out of nowhere. A man who was sailing on the ship Huronic recalled the experience of riding out the storm this way. Snow and sleet blinded us. The docks and engine room were solid ice. The ship was an iceberg. The wind blew 80 miles an hour, and the snow striking the pitching vessel froze as it struck. The ship tossed and lurched and creaked and trembled. It was a terrible sea, a wicked sea, such as I never saw before. Inside the ship, men were thrown like toys, and furniture was broken to bits. And just as a side note, I mean, they call it the Great White Hurricane. They're really not exaggerating. Hurricane, the... the the um level what am i looking for the um storm category what are you trying to say when they categorize winds mm-hmm. anything over i think it's 74 or 75 miles an hour was is hurricane force mm. and, and this was hurricane force winds the storm was worse than the larger lakes the eh utley and the heronic were both on superior the largest lake things on lake michigan and lake huron were quickly deteriorating as well On November 9th, the weather seemed favorable, a light breeze, the barometric pressure falling slightly, but nothing unusual. Ship captains saw no reason to avoid heading out. By the time the wind shifted and the storm arrived, they were caught too far away from shore to seek safety. Everyone was shocked by the arrival of the storm, which seemed to appear out of nowhere. One resident of the Canadian village of Port Clark, Ontario, said that when he went to church on Sunday morning, Lake Huron was as calm as glass. When he came out, it was so rough, no ship could leave port safely. And nevertheless, ships went out. Right. For example, the Henry B. Smith sailed out of port even as the storm started to surge on November 9, 1913. Another captain, Charles Fox, who had just brought his ship, the Choctaw, into port at Marquette, Michigan, to escape the storm, stood by baffled as Captain James Owen of the Smith sailed out into the storm. People were standing on shore watching the ship as it went into distress. The crew streamed onto the deck, even as waves crashed onto the ship, because the hatches on the deck, the doors to the cargo holds, began to flip open. Hatches? This seems... So insane to me. Hatches weren't typically held closed by clamps or handles or anything. Under normal conditions, the weight of the wood held those doors closed. But in a gale, they flipped open and allowed water to rush into the cargo holds, which obviously could cause the ship to sink, Mm -hmm. you know, let alone drown people. Right. Most crews used a sort of of middle-of-the-road approach, clamping the hatches down only as much as seemed immediately necessary, usually not enough to really keep water out. And often, they were still finishing this job as the ship headed out to sea. This meant that the Smith went out into Lake Michigan without its hatches fastened. Even in the severe weather, the crew had no choice but to run out onto the deck to finish fastening down those hatches. Within minutes, powerful waves began to hit the deck, rushing into the cargo holds. Although Owen had intended to head out further on the lake, he turned toward a point of land where he might be able to wait out the worst of the storm. Those left behind on shore could see, even through the blinding snow, the ship roll with a large wave and tip sideways as it fell into a trough of the water. It didn't go under, but instead kept going toward Kawina Point until it was out of sight. It was never seen again. Instead, a few days later, bits of the ship started to float, and even bodies of the dead began to float onto shore. Even a year later, people found skeletal remains of crew members on the shorelines. Ugh, yikes. Mm -hmm. Just as Captain Owen decided to take his ship out, even though the storm loomed, so did many other captains. Many of them recalled after the storm that they felt lulled into a false sense of confidence by their experience with other Great Lakes storms, which they had easily survived. They just did not realize that this storm was going to be much, much worse than anything they had ever seen. Another captain was S.A. Lyons of the steamer J.H. Sheetle. Lyons decided to leave port in Fort William, Ontario on November 6th because even though the bear... Even though the barometer was low, it was steady, and the wind seemed reasonable. But as soon as he got out onto the lake, it became clear that the wind was worse than he expected. 
Lions anchored the ship near an island where they could be out of the worst of the waves. They continued this way, sort of stopping and starting, stopping and starting, as they assessed the weather until early in the morning on November 9th. This is when things quickly became brutal. By mid-morning, they fought the winds and the waves just to keep the ship from being rolled and waves from crashing down onto the decks and taking on water. A few hours later, their visibility was obliterated by a blizzard. Despite the waves pounding the ship, they still tried to sit down for dinner (laughs) in the late afternoon. But as soon as they sat at the table, a massive wave crashed over them, flooding into the cabins of the ship and breaking many windows. The torrent of water swept through the kitchen, destroying all of their food stores except, and I quote, one ham and a few potatoes. And this becomes an important point later (laughs) on, I promise. Sounds like a delicious meal to me. It does. After this point, more and more water entered the interior areas of the ship, at times getting as high as four to six feet. The captain sent men to go throughout the boat and start securing it to prevent any more water from coming in. The men grabbed boards and went out to board up the broken windows, but the wind and waves were so intense that the men clung to whatever they could to avoid getting washed overboard. One of the men lost his grip and was almost washed out to the lake. See? Yeah, washed. What's interesting is I didn't realize as I was doing this that they referred to it as the The sea. sea. They would say, like, I've never seen the seas this bad. Right. Um, Which is interesting. But there... Because if it was in Europe, it would be called a sea. Right. Yeah. Well, this is a time when we were more European, I guess. Mm, maybe. So one of the men lost his grip and was almost washed out to sea and was only saved by his foot getting caught and keeping him aboard. A moment later, another monster wave knocked his foot loose. But again, he was serendipitously saved when he caught on a tow line that the wave had let loose on the deck. The men did eventually fight their way back to the kitchen. They found the cook and his wife standing knee-deep in freezing cold water, surrounded by all the floatsome and jetsam of the crew members' belongings. The poor wife, and why was she even on the ship? Right, but I guess that was sort of common practice, because there were a lot of women saved um, during this storm. Bring your wife. (laughs) Um, The wife was escorted to the engine room, which everyone guessed would be the safest place. Maybe. (laughs) Who knows? And she spent much of the rest of the storm wrapped in a blanket, locked inside. (laughs) Everyone was obviously extremely stressed because the situation required constant work and vigilance. Like, they couldn't step away from their posts for a moment. The ship's engineers, who generally took turns at the engines, had no choice but to work nonstop together to keep the ship carefully navigating those waves. When the first mate was sent to the aft of the ship to make an inspection, he was trapped when massive waves began cresting the midsection of the deck, making it impossible for him to get back to the prow. He tried several times, each time failing. Finally, soaked and nearly insensible from almost drowning multiple times and from the cold, he took shelter in the engine room, apparently with the cook's wife. (laughs) Oh, frisky. The captain made the perilous decision to turn the ship to stop them from venturing further out into the lake, but instead to head towards the safety of a shore, any shore. The turn itself was incredibly dangerous. The waves tossed and turned the ship so badly that it threw Captain Lyons up into the air more than once. But moving towards the shore was also dangerous. There was zero visibility, and because of the waves, Lyons could not accurately gauge their depth. He was terrified that he would hit a sandbar or otherwise beach the ship. They could slow the engines to kind of slow down the progress of the of the ship, Um, But the strength of the waves still kept them moving towards the shore. So this was all very perilous. Eventually, the winds slowed enough that they were able to drop anchor. And when the sun started to rise, the captain and crew were stunned (laughs) when they suddenly got visibility again to see another ship near them flipped upside down, surrounded by wreckage. Uh, When they looked in another direction, they saw the remains of a lighthouse that had been decimated. They were just incredibly lucky to have escaped more or less unharmed. And then sort of a funny ending to Captain Lyons is his official statement on the experience. He notes that late in the day on the 10th, Monday the 10th, they were finally able to sit down for another meal. And what did they eat? (laughs) They ate ham and potatoes Mm. because that's all they had. That's all they had. (laughs) In the end, Captain Lyons' memories of the storm are calm and restrained. 
It's clear that the storm was incredibly trying and that the entire crew came very close to death or deadly injury more than once. He, he explains it with the calm confidence of a seasoned Great Lakes mariner. In his letter, written after the storm to the company that owned the ship, he stated that, I can, quote, I can truthfully say to you that at no time during the storm did I have any fear, whatever, for the safety of the steamer, and if any of my crew thought differently, they did not show it. Perhaps the most harrowing tale among the many ships affected by the storm was the Elsie Waldo. Like many of his fellow captains, Captain John Duddleson left harbor on Friday the 7th, even though it quickly experienced rough seas. Shortly, though, the ship was said to have been hit by the Great Lakes' infamous Three Sisters, a grouping of three successive waves that are said to be unique to the lakes. The waves grouped together are a one, two, three punch that easily overwhelm a ship. This is what may have happened to the 1975 sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald. It's one of the theories, yeah. The Waldo was hit by a tremendous wave that destroyed the navigation systems in the pilot house. Without help navigating or shelter, the crew tried to continue to safety, but the ship soon crashed into a huge rock. Waves continued to crush it until the ship snapped in two. Thankfully, the crew had been huddled together in the prow of the ship, but unfortunately, all the supplies, the food, the blankets, all heat sources, were in the aft section. It seemed clear that they could not survive, but the chief engineer, Albert Lemke, jumped into action. Lemke rigged up a fireplace out of a bathtub and other wreckage to keep the passengers from freezing to death. But even with this heat source, the waves continued to wash over the ship, encasing the walls around the stranded mariners in ice. Amazingly, the shipwreck was spotted by the crew of another ship, the George Stevenson. As soon as the Stevenson made it into harbor, a crew member rode to shore through a blizzard, then walked for miles through the, the snow to find a way to help these people that were stranded on the Waldo. And that story is the story that is told about this. You know, mm -hmm. it, it could be apocryphal, but that's the story that has that, that, that this guy braved these terrible conditions to save the Waldo. The only way to help those people was to take a small motorized boat through incredibly dangerous conditions, so dangerous that they actually weren't even able to make it. The would-be rescuers were forced to turn around, and by the time they made the shore, they were literally frozen to their seats and unable to stand. They had to be chipped out of their seats with pickaxes. <laughs> they tried again to rescue the crew of the Waldo, this time with a larger motorized boat they had rigged up sort of out of desperation. At the same time, another rescue crew from another harbor had learned of the Waldo's plight. Miraculously, everyone on board the Waldo was saved. But of course, the damage was not limited to those on ships out on the lake. After an unusually warm fall, the people of Cleveland on the western shore of Lake Erie were expecting a profitable shipping season that might last longer than normal. Instead, the Great White Hurricane roared into town on November 9th, 1913, starting with heavy lake effect snows. As the day wore on, it quickly turned from a simple heavy snow. Um, but are we going to do... We've already talked about what lake yeah, effect snow Yeah, I mean, is. lake effect snow is heavy, big, fat flakes. Right. That pile up very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess as far as snow goes, it's, it's like warmer, right? It's wetter. Right, because, well, it's the effect of that very issue with the unfrozen lake being hit by a cold front and then that warm water right. being dumped then on the shore. Right, right, right. So it's it accumulates very, very quickly. It's very heavy. It, it's not a typical snowstorm. It's not right. It's not a snowstorm that you would get, say, in the, the Midwest. Right. It's, it's unique to the Great Lakes region. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not necessarily a blizzard. Even though no. sometimes colloquially we call them blizzards, right. they're not unless it has a certain low temperature and winds involved. Right. Typically, our, our um, lake effect storms don't have that, but mm -hmm. in this case it did. So this turned from a simple heavy snow to blizzard-like conditions with the wind whipping all that snow around and creating zero visibility. On the shore, ships were smashed into piers and docks, destroying fleets of boats in the harbors. 
The city ground to a halt as the weather made travel impossible. Railroad and streetcar lines were too covered with snow for cars to run. The wind knocked power lines down, and the city was gripped with panic about taking care not to touch wires, which, with the heavy drifting snow, could lurk unseen. Telephone and telegraph lines were out. Windows had been broken with the hurricane-force winds. Public health officials started to get nervous about a potential typhoid break outbreak when the city's water stopped started appearing brown, likely because the storm's raging waves churned up Lake Erie's silty bottom. City residents were asked to boil their water before using it. The disaster was compounded when a fire started to rage on one city block and firefighters struggled to control it through the heavy snow and wind. Then there was an explosion in Cleveland's Standard Oil plant, injuring a worker, but it was nearly impossible for an ambulance to get through the blocked streets. Clevelanders had to pitch in to help clear the streets and get the man to the hospital. And the people were also freaked out because their milk delivery stopped. Oh my goodness. Not the milk. How are you going to make your milk sandwiches? <laughs> well, that's what this made me think of. Yeah. I wonder if this is where, where this harkens from? back to that, like, oh my God, a Go lake effect storm is coming. Yeah. Get your milk and your bread so you can eat milk sandwiches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The milk stopped arriving on people's doorsteps, and local stores sold out quickly. City officials and milk produ producers had to issue statements begging city residents to refrain from buying milk unless they had babies or children. <laughs> it just cracks me up the idea that, like, oh, my God, if we don't have milk for three days, we will die. <laughs> right? That's the way it was during the storm. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, we were able to walk down to a, um, a – there's little tops at the end of our, our street. And, like, people would be walking back the other way. They're like, oh, they're out of milk. They're out of milk. And I'm like, who cares? All right. Like, <laughs> so I don't get some cereal, dude. Like, right. Like, I'm all right. Yeah. You, know? you, you could still cook something. You yeah. could drink water. Like, people yeah. were freaking out about the milk. Yeah. And it, what's funny is when there is a big storm coming, people will clear the shelves at oh, Wegmans yeah. of milk and bread. Yeah. And Why? The, the why? Two, what are you doing? The two most perishable food items exactly. in the store <laughs> you're right exactly. and what are you gonna do with it like what are you eating? suddenly suddenly a storm is coming and you're like shit i gotta chug this gallon of milk like, <laughs> it makes no Make sense bread to pudding <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> or like mush you know? dairy no just like mush up some bread and some milk <laughs> it's so weird people are so weird uh, so city officials, oh wait, so, so to, to, to try to avoid an uprising of angry milk customers, <laughs> <laughs> the Bell Vernon Mays Dairy, unable to transport milk by car, trolley, or train, started sending milk out on horse-drawn sleighs. They're so desperate. The, the desperation reached sleigh-drawn <laughs> levels. Another milk company, Cloverdale Farms Dairy, nearly lost two delivery, dri delivery drivers when they decided the only way to navigate the city was on the cleared railroad tracks. So they're, they're driving their truck down the railroad tracks because they could get into the city that way. Seems dangerous. Yeah. However, by this time, the trains had started to run again, and a train started uh, bearing down on them. They narrowly escaped certain death, were happily able to deliver their load of fresh milk to a hospital in desperate need yeah. of milk. Yes. You 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 don't want to deny those sick people of all that dairy. Dairy. <laughs> Feels good on the I mean, intestines. It's the hospital thing, all right, I get it. It's well, calories, and it's, like they well, need it. And whatever. it's one of those things that, you know how um, people for a long, long time, like, there were really specific things that they thought sick people had to eat, like right. quote unquote beef tea during the Civil War, which yeah. is like beef broth and milk right. and things right. like that. So, okay, fine, 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 fine. Oh, yeah. Vitamin D. Okay, so yeah, um, this milk shortage. And the historian Michael Shoemaker makes the point that this was in a time period before people could safely store perishables for more than a day or so. And people were accustomed to going to the market once per day or every other day. So people were very worried about running out of food. And there was no real way of knowing when the weather would turn. It was nearly a week later when temperatures started to rise and things slowly began to return to normal. 
The storm peaked on Sunday, November 10th, 1913, and by midweek, people throughout the Great Lakes region were starting to grapple with the aftermath. Though Cleveland had taken a terrible beating, other cities were reeling as well. Chicago had recently completed harbor and seawalls, um, which were now crumbled by the force of the tremendous waves. Milwaukee's harbor was completely destroyed. Windows were smashed in all the buildings facing the lake in Duluth, and sidewalks were torn up and scattered. Out on the lake, the toll of the storm continued to surface, sometimes literally. One salvage tugboat, the Sarnia City, were out on Lake Huron when they saw something massive and black floating up out of the water like a sea monster. It was the keel of a freighter. It was a huge vessel, looming out of the water only the tiniest bit. There's this great picture in uh, Michael Shoemaker's book about the storm of this keel rising out of the water. And it's, you know, it's just water as far as you can see. And then there's just like this small sliver of black sticking out, just like the very smallest portion of this keel. Um, And if I could understand how someone could look at that and think like, it's Nessie, right, or, you right. know, or it's what, what's the one in Lake Champlain? Champ? Champ. Yeah. yeah. Um, How do you know that? Because I know things. It's <laughs> weird. Have you ever seen Champ? Yeah, I saw him one time. Oh, My father-in-law swears, swears that he saw ne- uh, Nessie. There's also, there's a Newport Lake up in the Northeast Kingdom, and we had uh, Memphrey, because it's like Memphremagog. Memphrey. Memphremagog? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I'm moving to Vermont. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. Uh, full the, of sea monsters, full apparently. Full of sea monsters. Well, you know, <laughs> to keep out the Flatlanders, um, like yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, The captain of the Sarnia City said, quote, I think it is one of the big fellows. I think she was headed back toward the river, running for shelter, when she must have been caught in a trough and bowled over. It was sort of symbolic of this big storm. A massive, powerful ship considered to be easily able to take on the might of the lake, rendered completely destroyed, its crew taken by the waves. Evidence of the storm's destructive power continued to haunt the people of the Great Lakes region for weeks. Chunks of ships, boxes, canned goods, lifeboats, all sorts of detritus appeared on beaches in the region. Bodies washed to the shore, battered by the waves and rocks, wrapped in ineffective life vests and caked in ice. In the best situations, those on shore were able to identify them through the contents of their pockets or clothing, but sometimes this was impossible. In one instance, a devastated family prepared to bury their son, who had been drowned on the wreck of the James Carruthers. When the ceremony was interrupted by a knock on the door of the church and the sudden appearance of the young man himself, who was very much not dead. It turns out that he had just happened to, at the last minute, take a job on a different boat, sort of serendipitously missing the wreck of the Carruthers. The other young man in the casket had not been so lucky, and he was never identified. Mm. Of course, being a story of the sea, among the items washed up on the shore were messages tucked into bottles. On November 22nd, a bottle washed up in Pentwater, Michigan, that read, Dear wife and children, we were left up here in Lake Michigan by McKinnon, captain of the James H. Martin Tug at Anchor. He went away and never said goodbye or anything to us. Lost one man yesterday. We have been out in storm 40 hours. Goodbye, dear ones. I might see you in heaven. Pray for me, Chris K. P.S. I felt so bad. I had another man write for me. Goodbye forever. And for some reason, that that should be really sad. But it makes me laugh because it's like, goodbye forever at the end. (laughs) You know, I know it it was not written sarcastically, but it sounds like that to me. He meant it for real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He really did. Um, The man who was identified as Chris Keenan, a U.S. Marshal serving as a, a guard on the ship Plymouth, later washed up, his body washed up in Manistee, Michigan. Sad. Another message washed ashore in Buffalo, this time scrawled on a door. The city had been on edge as authorities searched for the only boat to go missing in Lake Erie near Buffalo, a lighthouse ship called, conveniently, Lighthouse 82. Yeah, it was very creative naming. No sign of it could be found except this cabin door, on which was scrawled the words, apparently written by the ship's captain, Goodbye, Nellie. Ship is breaking up fast. Williams. 
People immediately thought it was a hoax. He never called his wife Nellie, and it wasn't the captain's handwriting. Seems bad. Seems like a bad yeah, sign. <laughs> it's not, not good. But later, the captain's wife and other residents of Buffalo decided it was probably just written on Williams's behalf by the first mate. So devastated by her husband's disappearance, Williams's wife, Anna Marie, actually sailed out for several days, searching for signs of Lighthouse 82 around the Lake Erie shore. She found nothing. It was not until 1915 that Lighthouse 82 was discovered, when she was then pulled up, salvaged, and amazingly refitted. Isn't that wild? It is wild. It had been submerged for two years. But it's wood. And they pulled it up. No, it wasn't wood. It was metal? Um, yeah. Pulled it up, salvaged it, and then it just went back to work. Isn't that crazy? Sad. Uh, Lighthouse 82 went on to serve as a light ship again for another several decades, uh, although none of the crew was ever found. In the just over 100 years since the Great White Hurricane, some of the wrecks have slowly been relocated. A legend of shipwreck hunters on the lakes is that the ships will only be found when they are ready to share their secrets with the living. For instance, the ill-fated Henry B. Smith, um, one of the first ships we talked about was just discovered in 2013. And there, are, I, I will link this in the show notes, but there are some amazing underwater photographs of the, the Henry B. Smith. Cool. Three ships have still never been found. Mm. Um, and just to give you an idea of what this looked like, um, the number of ships lost um, on Lake Superior, there were two. Michigan, there was one. Huron, there were eight. Jeez Louise. Erie, there was one. The only one on Erie was the Lighthouse 82. Um, Stranded, Superior, there were eight. Michigan, there were three. Huron, there were ten. And Erie, there were five. Amazingly, Lake Ontario was not affected. It hmm. experienced a storm, but it was much, much weaker. And there were no wrecks on, on Ontario. Um, and of course, the number of people dead was at least 250. And I say at least because that is just counting people from shipwrecks, not including any deaths that may have taken place on shore because of mm. the weather. And we also know it's incomplete because we know that some ships went down and left behind no record of how many crew members were on board. Um, or we don't know. Um, um, there was one instance where there was a ship where some people were saved and in the process, other people were lost and they, they didn't, it was too chaotic for them to keep count. And so we don't know exactly, but it was at least 250. I mean, that's just, that's an, a huge number of people. Sure. Yeah. Well, no, it's, uh, how, many, how many people died in November? Like five, something, oh, yeah, like, that. something like that. Um, Eight. I mean, um, but I think about, I mean, we are used to thinking about high body counts, um, to put it sort of crassly, with actual hurricanes yeah. or with tornadoes. Right. But storms on the Great, Le- Great Lakes had have just as much potential to kill hundreds of people right. as anywhere else. Um, Snow is dangerous. Yeah, but I think that we've we've sort of we sort of think that we've tamed the Great Lakes. Like we sort of think that. First of all, that they're lakes, and so they're not that dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, and we get we just so accustomed to their presence in our lives. At least m- me, having grown up on the shore of Lake Ontario, and now living on sort of the shore of Lake Erie, um, they're just part of your everyday life, and you forget that they can be incredibly dangerous. Mm-hmm. And so, whenever there is a bad storm on one of the lakes, or when um, the the weather changes or something, I I I have this like weird habit of thinking like this is this is the end. No, I have this habit of thinking like this is Ontario reminding us. Like this mm-hmm. is Ontario reminding us of its power. Mm-hmm. Um I know that sounds really stupid, but that's the way that I think about it. I think about kind of how every once in a while the earth has to kind of say like this is what I can do. I know that mm-hmm. sounds dumb, but that's just how I think about these things. And mm-hmm. a, a good example of this is just this past year um, Lake Ontario surged around the New York State um, edge of Ontario. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it affected Canada at all, Ontario, but um, it, there was tremendous flooding, like there has never been. Yeah. And like I mentioned, we can have seiches where the the water can pile up on one end of the lake, and we've had that kind of flooding, but it, they're short lived. They mm-hmm. come in and they wash back out, kind of like a tide. Yeah. 
Um, but this flooding was for months mm -hmm. and destroyed properties. Um, it was it was really really severe. I mean, j just speaking from personal experience, it was one of the most surreal things I've ever seen. Is to go outside of my cottage and the lake was on our front yard. Mm -hmm. I mean, our entire front yard was underwater. That's never ever happened before. So I I, I think of those things as the lakes reminding us that you can't uh, mess with them. You seem really underwhelmed. That's right. She just keeps looking at me like I'm the dumbest person she's ever met. So it's making this end of episode conversation really <laughs> difficult. <laughs> But no. I'm, am I the only one of us that has a connection, like a sort of a deep connection to the lakes, though? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean we, sure. I grew up on a different lake. Yeah, but I mean the Great Lakes particular, yeah. in particular. It's a little Great Lake. No. It's not, but... It is. It's special. I mean, the, my only uh, experience with the Great Lakes is I used to work as, like, an admissions advisor at this school down in Texas, and there was somebody that was coming in, and he had been a captain on the Great Lakes. Yeah. And so he was talking to me about, like being the sea captain on the Great Lake and I was just like, I yeah. have no idea what you're talking about. Right. And like that that's a lake. What? Uh, yeah. You know? And when you hear lake, you're like, okay. Like And then big I deal. get up here and like standing on the edge of it. Yeah. And looking out, it's like being at the seashore. It's a like, seashore. Yeah. Do not see the other side. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Enormous. Yeah. Yeah. Um and I mean my my connection to the Great Lakes is really sort of deep. My my dad grew up right on the the shore, uh, right um, at the corner of New York State, where the um, uh, St. Lawrence River dumps into Lake Ontario, mm -hmm. and then we have a cottage on one of the bays off of Lake Ontario. So I spent my whole life on the shores of Lake Ontario, and my dad, um, for his kind of first part of his career working for New York State, was as um, a research working on a research vessel mm -hmm. um, that was owned by New York State and um, Department of Conservation, f essentially fishing. Like, he was sort of a fisherman, but he wasn't, like, fishing. He was fishing to, like, gauge how many, you know, alewives were in the lake at any given time. And it, it's so funny because, you know, people would come to our cottage and they'd be like, Chris, you're really good at you know, driving boats, take us out on the bay. You know, my dad was always like, oh, I fucking hate boats. Like boats are the worst. <laughs> they always break. And it came from his experience living on a boat yeah. um, during storms on Lake Ontario. He, of course, nothing, nothing like this particular storm, but right. even just rough. Because he was probably smart enough not to do it in November. Yeah, no, they, they didn't. They only did it during the summer and they were laid off during the winter. Um, you know that my department now has this whole summer program where we work with the historic Brig Niagara. Yeah. Um, which is a, was it a recreation, I guess? Mm, or, I think so, but I, I don't know. It's not an original, but it's, it, I mean, it's, yes. it's built in the same style as a 19th century Lake Erie vessel would have been built. And right. we send out 20 students and one professor to be the crew that's amazing every summer for three weeks and they have to learn how you know they climb the rigging oh. and they have to pull the anchor up together yeah. and it's crazy and um the thing that they talk about when they come back is oh it's kind of cold out there <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. In the exactly middle, it's like the middle of summer right but it's it's windy and cold yeah, yeah. It, it's not no summer vacation yeah exactly and that's what my dad used to say is like it seems it seems like a fun recreational thing but when you're actually out there living on one of these boats yeah it loses its charm really yeah. really fast although and, yeah. I, I should say it's too bad that I didn't like that that didn't exist when I was when I was younger because I would you definitely would have, have signed up for that. One of my dreams, I actually I actually really considered joining the Coast Guard That's when weird. I was younger because I, I could think of no better career than being out on the water all the time. Mm. Although I have no practical skills, so I couldn't have actually done it. <laughs> but it sounded you so would have I'm sure yeah, I would have, but you know? I, it sounded so wonderful and romantic to me, but You can take it as a as a class. Yeah, I will. It's only like $6,000. Oh, yeah, I got that laying around, no problem. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. They also have to stay up in shifts because, obviously, you have to, like, watch for other boats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And shores. Right. So they stay up in six-hour shifts right. all night long. 
Well, and something that's that's weird about this, too, is that my dad was out working on Lake Ontario at the time that the Edmund Fitzgerald went down mm-hmm. during a time period when it was thought that ships just didn't sink on Lake Ontario, on the lakes anymore. Right. Like, we, we are beyond why that. Why would they? It's the 20th century. Yeah, it's 1975. Like, yeah. we're, like, that's not a thing. That's, a, like, a, a, a thing of the past. We've the lakes. Um, and, and that made a pretty big impression on my dad. And by the time he met my mom, he was like, I got, this is, this is not a job for a guy that's got a wife and kids. And so that's when he became a DEC officer. Hmm. What's DEC? Department of Environmental Conservation. Yeah, good story. Yeah. So that's the end of your episode. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, that's good. It's actually... You're the worst. You're like, so that, is that it? <laughs> that it you, you were a really gonna, shitty episode. are we gonna wrap it up i'm saying let's wrap it up let's yeah. wrap it up yeah let's do it so well, how do we wrap it up i don't know so be careful out there this november when you're sailing around on the great lakes or just don't do that yeah don't do that not don't this that. time of year i mean certainly come up here and um and go out in the summer or get a hotel room with a view of the lake so you can watch a snowvember happen. Yes. Oh, and you know what you can do? You can do is go um, go get a hotel room on facing the lake and mm-hmm. you can see the ships because the, the mm. Great Lakes is still a very important um, shipping channel. It is. Um, and so you can see these big, huge, awesome ships. And my grampy... My grandpa used to have a boat... Uh, a boat. My grand He did have a boat, but he had a book... With all of the ships that navigate the Great Lakes Mm -hmm. in it. And he used to check them off whenever he saw one from his kitchen window of his summer house. Yeah, it was really cute. It's cute. Yeah. Grampy. My grandpa. He's funny. Well, hug your grandpa and thanks for listening. He's dead, but okay. I mean, not your (laughs) grandpa. You people go hug your grandpa. (laughs) You hug your grandpas who aren't dead. Yes. And make sure you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. And in your dreams. And in your dreams. And visit Dig Post Dig Pod Dig Pasta Cast. <laughs> She's thinking about that risotto. Now. Thinking about that risotto. Dig Podcast org for all of our show notes and further reading mm-hmm. and transcripts and transcripts. Um, make sure that you are subscribed if you haven't already. We're mm-hmm. on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, everywhere you get your podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um, we- a-, a tune in radio. We just. Made sure that we were back up and running on TuneIn Radio as well. Yep. So we're where you want to be and you are where we are going to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. We are in your soul and you are in ours. And we love you. So thanks for listening. We'll catch you on the flips. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye forever. <laughs> Goodbye forever. <laughs> the storm was worst on the largest lakes. Is that a real word? Worst? Yeah, the storm was worse on the larger lakes. Alright, it looks like a sausage to me. You look like a sausage. (laughs) (laughs) I timed it. Good.